Um, I hope that we will manage to, to go through actually. Uh, well, I actually realized that uh, we might not need more than two meetings or I don't know, in the worst case scenario, three. And we're done with the book. Oh my God. Like, yay, um, <laughs> yay I know. <laughs> <laughs> like so almost two years later. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's super exciting, I think. Um, but this is a nice chapter. Also, um, I think the whole idea behind, especially this part that is the communication part, is mostly to uh, prompt us to try out some different ways we can plot and um, uh, format our, our markdown files. Well, I mean, the first part is obviously an introduction to what is our markdown and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, the, the second part is more of like, exploration and prompting you to just check out what other formats are available. But let's jump into it. So in this chapter, we have like those learning objectives that um, we, by the end of it, we shall know how to create our MacDowd documents and how to format text using Pandocs, Pandocs Markdown. We shall also know how to include our code chunks in our markdown documents and use check options to change what displays uh, in our markdown document. This is quite cool. And also we will know how to use a NICAR cable to display formatted tables instead of like the, um, uh, the ones that are automatically um, uh, generated by the R code. Uh, the cache data in our markdown document, uh, and also how to set global check options uh, and embed inline code in an R markdown document. So let's start with the introduction. So obviously we have been exploring all the previous parts uh, in this uh, process here. So we've seen import and how to tidy your data and how to transform and very lately how to model them. And now we are on the communicate uh, part and also a bit on the visualization, as I said, uh, because this is also a part of the communication, right? Um, because as it says here, um, visualization modeling are, are essential for communication because this is how you uh, actually communicate the results to other people in your field. And uh, results per se are not as important as communicating them to the people that may be uh, interested. Uh, so, uh, okay, we will learn about our markdown, which is a tool for integrating pros, code, and results. I really like this definition. And uh, as it points out here, we can use the R markdown as a notebook uh, for an analyst to analyze communi communication, but as well as a report uh, for analyst to decision maker communication. So you can either just document what you're doing so as to keep your workflows and what you're doing pretty clear and communicate your work to other analysts and even to yourself actually, <laughs> because you will need to understand what you were doing in previous projects. And uh, also as a, as a means to report your findings to people that uh, will make decisions about your work. And thanks to the power of our markdown formats, uh, you can even use the document, yeah, for both purposes. Uh, for the graphics communication, as it says, we will learn uh, how to, uh, to take your exploratory graphics and turn them into a expository graphics. So at first you sort of explore what graphics, uh, graphic possibilities are available in R, and then you can decide on um, which one is the best fitting your purposes and also um, uh, is the more clear because as we will see later, and I think we have already seen the first chapters about ggplot and stuff like that, that sometimes um, 
you should uh, play a bit with the borders or with the limits of the plots to make them fit accordingly to the data. And also, uh, yeah, we will learn a little about the many other varieties of outputs that you can actually produce with our Markdown. And at the end, we have a, a very small chapter actually about the R Markdown workflow, which I expect we shall see like not today, the yeah, next. Uh, as it says, this chapter focuses mostly on the technical mechanics of communication and not with the really hard problems of communicating your thoughts to other humans. I mean, this is a totally different <laughs> aspect to look at it, and I don't think that you can address it just in the chapter, you may need a different book about it. Uh, but yeah, obviously uh, we're gonna see the practicalities of it. So um, our MacDown, as uh, uh, it is already mentioned, is a unified authoring framework for data science, which combines code, results, and prose commentary. Uh, so um, this is like a combination of text and also code and uh, as um, uh, because R is an open language is actually fully reproducible and also the the best part of it is that it supports uh, other uh, no different output formats like PDF word files slideshows HTML uh, uh, output and yeah you have many, many um, uh, options uh, for an armored down file output. And yeah, all right. I mean, we have already said that the, the use that you may put armored down uh, in your, uh, your work. And uh, R Markdown integrates a number of R packages and external tools, um, but uh, help is not available with the usual uh, question mark that, for example, we use sometimes when we have like a code just to check uh, if uh, um, check the documentation of a certain package or a function. Uh, but uh, we have some other resources, and uh, the the book um, uh, like um, uh, proposes these cheat sheets that are super useful. And I guess everybody that has worked with R Markdown has at some point uh, used some of these. Uh, I'm sending also like the um, the resource in the chat. Uh, both of these cheat sheets proposed here are available in the R Studio sources website. Um, the the best thing about our markdown is that you don't need any package. Uh, you don't have to load it or install it. It's uh, automatically uh, uh, like in our studio. So you just have to open our studio. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And so the basics are that you have an optional uh, uh, YAML header, which is surrounded by the hyphens. So if I change it to source here, oh, so here we can see the YAML. So we have three hyphens on the top and then three hyphens here. Then you have title author and date. You can have an actual date here. I have like set it to have the system date, meaning that every time I need the document, the, um, the date will automatically update to the date of today. It takes the, the system date, the, the date of my computer. And here we have like output HTML, but we could have either uh, output uh, PDF or Word. Uh, we can actually have all of those, I mean, it doesn't matter. And then we have some extra stuff, but these are optional, you don't have to have them. But all our markdown documents have title, author, and date. Uh, so turning back to the bigger 
version of the uh... okay so we were here and um, we can also have chunks of code in our R markdown that are surrounded by the I don't know how to call it code. but yeah you get the idea it's uh, Here it is. So we have these and these, and we have explicitly to have like the curly brackets, then have uh, R. We can actually have just have it just like this, but as uh, it will be mentioned later, it's better to have like a title per chunk uh, because this way it's easier to organize a bit your, your work. And also when you get error messages, this is very helpful. You get like the name of the chunk that the error was spotted. So you don't have to search for the line or I don't know, it's more, I find it at least personally more easy to, to spot a mistake when I have name. Um, so we already see that we have a combination of like text and also code chunks. And, and yeah, we have also text with simple text formatting. Uh, so in general, the R markdown is, is using some very basic like HTML um, formatting stuff. Like for example, you're using the hash for the headings. Uh, we have here, yes. Here we have like um, a, a sort of uh, table with the basic formatting things that we have to know about our markdown. So uh, when you have like a word between uh, asterisks uh, is italics, you can also have like the, um, the, the height and the big one, the like or italics, or uh, you can have double asterisks for bold or to long hyphens. And when you're using the, this is not like uh, quotation marks, but it's like the, the single, I don't know how to, to call it. You, you have code. So this part between the, uh, the I don't know, the one quotation mark thing uh, is uh, is in the text as code. So, for example, yeah, here. This is uh, in my original in my source uh, R markdown file. Is um, it has a the thing? So here you have the superscript and the subscript. And then we have the headings. So the for one hash is like a very big headline. Then you can have like two hashes and then it's like smaller, smaller. You have until four or five levels, I think, of headings that you can choose. Um, Lists are very easy to create because you just have to have an asterisk or a hyphen, and then you automatically have bulleted uh, lists. You can even have levels. You just have a tab here and then an asterisk. An asterisk. And also you can have numbered lists, um, and you just have to like a number, then you will have a numbered list here. Uh, best part is that you can, of course, uh, have uh, media in the text, like images and links, or I don't know, even GIFs or whatever. Um, and uh, you can have links that are actually uh, clickable when you have them between the these things <laughs> and you can also have like a, an image uh, even with a, 
with the subtitle. Uh, if you have uh, the, the brackets, the square brackets, and then in the parentheses, you have uh, either a link that goes directly to the image or uh, a path to your computer, to your local system um, with the image you want to have. And also you can create very simple tables like these uh, here. So with the hyphens, and the, uh, you can create like columns like this. And uh, as it says here, um, oh yeah, here. The, the, the best way to learn all those stuff is of course to try them out. Uh, because now, I mean, to see it for the first time, it might seem a bit confusing. But if you try it out in an armored down file, I think it will all come way more clear. And uh, as it says, it will definitely become second nature after a while. So you don't need to think about them or worry too much about them. And of course, you can have like the armored down quick reference, or you can check out the cheat sheet in case you get specific formatting that you don't usually use. And now moving to the more uh, sophisticated parts of the R Markdown file, we have like the code chance. So we can actually run the code inside an R Markdown document. Um, and when we need to do that, we have to insert a chunk. And there are three ways uh, to do so. We can either do it by the um, shortcut, the, key, the keyboard shortcut that enters, uh, how to say, like inserts a code chunk automatically, or uh, use the insert button here. So as we can see, we have different um, different options of languages to use. We can even like use a Python code chunk or an SQL one, but the, the one that we have inside the markdown, the, the R Studio ID is, of course, R. And, and yeah, we can, of course, do it manually too, like by doing the this and then this and then this. And as you see here, I'm in the, here I'm, I'm in the visual uh, version of the document. So, it just took a while to realize that it's actually constant. And well, anyway, this shall be the you should close it. You have also to have like the, the three dots, and at the end, the, the three again, not dots, like quotation, whatever. And Obviously, it's recommended to use the shortcut because it's just easier and yeah, you don't have to do a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very easy to do. Uh, so now we're moving to the to naming of chunks. As I said, uh, can give. Uh, every uh, R chunk a name, it should be a unique name. So you cannot have like two chunks uh, with the same name. And you just have to, to enter like your preferred name, whatever it might be, uh, just after uh, the R here. So you can have like R test, whatever. And that will be the name of the chunk. And um, this has the advantages. At first, it's more easily to navigate to specific chunks. Uh, also, this is also very nice. Graphics produced by the chunks will have useful names and it will make that easier to use them elsewhere. So you can spot like, your, your chunks <laughs> easier and yeah, play around with them um, in a more um, efficient way. And you can also set up networks of uh, cache chance to avoid performing expensive computations. Well, we will see about cached 
Elspeth, I don't know how to pronounce that. I, I'm not sure if that's the correct way anyway. But yeah, we will see about that. Uh, actually, um, something I didn't know about our markdown is that you can have some chunks that uh, you may not want to recompute uh, if you haven't changed something. So you can have R saving the computation that it did for a specific chunk or uh, like many chunks, depends, uh, if you haven't changed things in your code, which is kind of cool because you don't have to wait for, for R markdown so long to need a very long document if it's like very, very heavy computationally speaking. But we will see that in the sub chapter below. And yeah. So, what other options we have uh, to customize the chunk output? Uh, you have like almost 60 options that you can use to customize your code chunks, which is kind of impressive, I think. And obviously, here we will cover the most important ones. You have uh, eval faults, evaluation faults that prevents the code from being evaluated and uh, this code means mainly will not run. So the results will not be generated in the needed file when you um, make the armor down file to your preferred output. This code chunk will not be uh, in any way in your document. Uh, you can have also include faults, which is kind of useful because uh, it doesn't show the code uh, or the results in the final document. And um, uh, this is useful, especially for the setup uh, chunk, that the one that you have with your uh, setup libraries and all that stuff, if you don't want it to be in your uh, R markdown file, but you obviously want it to run because if if it doesn't run, for example, if we had it eval false, it wouldn't run at all. So uh, you would have uh, errors in the chunks that you had your uh, analysis. But uh, if you have just include false, it means that it, uh, it would run, but it won't have it won't be uh, presented again in your output file. And then we have echo false, which prevents code, but not the result from appearing. This is very useful for um, uh, visualizations because this way you can have like the graph or the table and not like the, the code that you have written. Uh, message faults or warning faults prevents messages or warnings from appearing in the finished file. Uh, and you can also have like the results hide with highs printed output and fix show hide again with hide float. I don't know in which cases you might need them, but I mean, depends, I guess, uh, on what you're trying to do. Uh, also, an interesting one is this one, error true. So this causes the, the render, like the meeting, to continue if you, even if you get an error. So usually, um, R markdown, at least to my experience, is very picky with errors. So you can have like a tiny thing, a typo somewhere, and something couldn't uh, that R markdown won't like, and it won't meet the document. It will just have errors and stuff like that. Uh, but in case you want the code to continue working, even if it encounters an error, meaning that something on your uh, on your code won't run and it won't presented as you wish, um, you can use that error true. And as it's points out here, uh, this might be uh, useful for teaching purposes or I don't know. And here you have like um, a table that summarizes all the options and what each of them does. Uh, now, moving to the tables, uh, by default, R markdown prints data frames and matrices, as you see in the console here. So we have here, okay, it's already done already. Uh, this, this is like the empty cars, one to five. Um, and we have like this automatically generated uh, table by R. 
but if we want to display our data with more with an additional formatting we can use like the neat art cable thing here um the, this function uh, generates the the table we can see here and yeah i don't know if it's way more impressive but at least i mean uh, it's probably easier for somebody that um hasn't worked with R before and uh, is more of a naive uh, reader of your work uh, because we don't have like the, uh, the variables names as we have in the first table. And also, um, yeah, the, the formatting is a bit more, I don't know, professional probably. Um, okay. Back, Daniel. Yeah, yes, I am. I'm not sure what happened, but it seems like my my internet went off. Sorry for that. Okay, no, no worries. I mean, I, I just was a bit confused because I was like, now shall I continue <laughs> or shall I wait? Okay, so I'm happy you're back. Uh, yeah. I don't know, did you catch what I was saying about the tables that you have like the different formatting here that you can yeah, have like- so I, I lost I lost this part. I, I think I was just above this part itself. Okay, yeah, so here? The, yes, perfect. Okay, okay. So um, uh, we said about the, um, the different options that you have for, um, uh, say customizing the output of your chunks and mm -hmm. here you also have this table in the book obviously because this is basically the book <laughs> um, and you can see like all the options at least the most important ones and what each of that uh, inhibits and yeah just to have a clear idea so as i was saying uh, you also have like um, uh, the possibility, the the possibility, but like the, the option to to have a prettier table when you're using our markdown uh, instead of um, using the tables that are by default generates, which are like uh, this one here that you have with empty cars. Um, you can have a more professional sort of looking table with metar cable and it's it's not that it's so much more improved but uh, i mean the font is a bit different and also you don't have like the variables names like you have here and yeah it might look a bit more professional i, I don't know i mean depends on what you want the table wh where you want to to have your table and stuff like that. But in general, you have a lot of different options. One of them is the NITAR cable. And uh, you can see, as it says here, you can uh, read the documentation for the NITAR cable to see other ways in which you can customize the table. And uh, there are a lot of other um, packages uh, as proposed here, Xtable, Stargazer, Pander, Tables, ASCII, and other, a, a lot of packages for um, uh, customizing tables even more. And each of, oh, each of those provides a set of tools for format tables uh, from our code. So uh, now about caching that I was uh, talking about it before. And um, as it says here, normally it's need of a document. Uh, it's time, namely, that the R renders the document to an output, like a, a Word document or a PDF. It starts from a completely clean slate. So it starts from point zero and um, it gradually uh, renders a document. So you can even see like the, the, the percentage in your console, so from zero until uh, 100. Uh, however, this can be painful 
if you have computational computations that take a long time, indeed, if you have like um, models that are very complicated and take a while to compute, uh, this can be indeed quite uh, nerve wracking. And um, you can have the a solution as uh, it uh, says here is to have cache equals true. And when you set this option, uh, you actually save the output of the chunk to a specifically named file on the disk. So when you run the document again, instead of starting from a clean slate, it uses this saved file in order to, uh, uh, I have to say, like to load basically the computations that you have run in the previous meeting. So it doesn't, uh, you don't have to wait until it meets a very long computation. It, uh, it loads it from a previous um, meeting. Uh, but as it says here, this option should be used with care because by default, this is based on code only. So if you, uh, the, um, uh, the caching is, working only if it spots out that the, that the code is exactly the same. So it cannot check if your CSV, for example, has changed. So in case you have uh, leave your code as is, but uh, you have changed a very large here CSV file, um, it doesn't know that this has changed. So uh, you should be, uh, careful with that. And uh, as it's here, if the deep clear pipeline uh, is changed, um, right, so uh, a way to resolve the, the problem, to avoid it basically, is to use a, a depends on chunk option. So here you may have like, our process data here is the, um, the name of the chunk. Then we can have cache equals two. Then we can have depends on raw data. And uh, by this, uh, we verify that, let's say, um, uh, the, the, we verify that it won't run in case that we have some change uh, in the CSV. Um, right. Ah, a good function to check if our files have changed. And because as I said, the the, the cache option only checks for the code and not for the uh, CSV changes, uh, is to use the file.info function, which returns information about our, uh, our file that we use, uh, and specifically when it was last modified. So if we have like, um, have like here, cache extra equals file info, a very, large file CSV. And this shall return information about the, about the, the CSV per se. Um, okay, uh, this can be used in cases, as I said, that you have very uh, complicated computations that you don't want to uh, wait for them to render uh, each and every time you run an RMW down file. So, um, apart from the uh, options that you have of, custom of customizing the different uh, uh, code chunks, uh, each and uh, every, each and every of them, every yeah, whatever, <laughs> each of them. You can also have some global options of customization. So 
uh, for example, uh, you can set like Nitar set comment and for example, collapse equals true. And these, as it says here, like the, the writer of the book points out that he uses these uh, because it's his preferred common formatting and ensures that the code and output are kept closely uh, and wide. And for example, if you're prepare, preparing a report, you might set uh, echo equals false right from the beginning. So this means that for all your chunks, your code won't be there, but you just have the output if you're just creating a report for decision maker and you know that uh, they won't need your code. It would just be, um, uh, uh, how to say like, you don't, you will not need, need it uh, on your report. And yeah, you, uh, yes. Or you may consider sending message fold or false or warning false and, stuff like that but as it says again you should be cautious with that because uh in this case it might be harder to debug problems in case they occur uh, because you won't get any any messages warning you about errors in the final document now uh inline code uh, a thing that actually i think makes our markdown very very powerful is that you can have code in line uh within your text uh using the um, using r uh, as we will see example yeah here so uh when the report is neat the results of the computations that are in that uh, so you have like the uh, single quotation mark here and here and then you have r and then something that holds like a variable or something like that. And the best thing is that every time this changes in your, in your data, it will be automatically updated. So you don't have every time to, uh, to change it in order to report the correct number. It will be automatically updated. And I think this is, uh, very, very uh, powerful, at, at least for, for reporting research results or, I don't know, stuff that you can have like more data or uh, the values might change in the future. Yeah, it's super useful. Uh, so these inline computations, as it says, are inserted into the text. And yeah, here we have an example, it's like, as it would show in the source document, let's say it would be like R n row diamonds and n row diamonds again minus n row smaller. So these actually will compute um, uh, subtraction here, and here we will see like we will see the that text. Um, like this in the output file. So it shows us like the, the, diamond, the number of the diamonds. And, uh, and here we have like uh, the, the outcome of the subtraction, like 126 uh, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, uh, it is again, highlighted here that in order to insert numbers into text, we can use format, which is as it says here, your friend, because this allows us to set the number of digits. So it won't be, it won't print ridiculous decrease of accuracy and stuff like that, like too many um, uh, decimal points that, and you can also have like big mark to make uh, numbers easier to read. And here it uh, also, uh, the, the right also proposed uh, a helper function that combines like the two uh, format and big mark uh, that you can use for. Work. Now uh, about troubleshooting. Um, 
So again, troubleshooting in our markdown might be a bit tricky. As I said, it's also quite picky when it comes to tiny errors that might be problematic and this might uh, be a very nerve wracking process when you want to meet a document that is quite big and you have like, I don't know, some weird error some, somewhere in your, in your code sometimes. And uh, here, the first thing that you should try to do is like just restart R and then run all chunks. Um, what also makes uh, troubleshooting in R Markdown more challenging is that you're not in the interactive R environment, let's say. So you have the code chunks that are interactive, but like the rest of the file is just uh, text, or at least text with inline code depends on what exactly you file design. And um, so you might, as it says, if the restarting doesn't work and running all the chunks again for this or it doesn't solve the problem, uh, you're going to need to systematically explore the, the options that you have for troubleshooting. Um, you, uh, the most, uh, as it says, the most common difference is the working directory. Uh, so uh, the working directory of R Markdown is the directory in which R Markdown leads. Uh, so it might be that you are not in the right working directory, so you cannot access like the files that you're trying to uh, load and you have um, issues with that. Uh, so by, um, by writing get uh, working directory uh, in, in a chunk, you should get the, the location in your uh, in your computer that you're working at. So you can either change it or at least see where in your computer you are <laughs> and change it accordingly. And yeah, basically you, you can try to brainstorm all things that might cause a bug and systematically check uh, all the big chunks all of these. Right. So moving to the YAML header, uh, as we saw, like every R document has a R Markdown, not all R documents, but R Markdown documents do have a YAML header. And uh, by tweaking the parameters of the YAML header, header we can actually um, uh, control, let's say, the whole document. And YAML actually stands for yet another marked up uh, language, which is kind of funny, I didn't know that. And uh, this is used for representing hierarchical data in a way that's easier for humans to read and write. And uh, the R documents are, they are Markdown actually uses it, uses it to control details about the output. And uh, here we'll, we'll discuss the document parameters and the bibliographies. Um, so the parameters is, as we saw, like the first um, information that we have in an R Markdown file. Um, Here, for example, it says this example uses a my class parameter to determine which class of cars to display. So we have output HTML document, params, my class, and we have include false library, and library. It, oh, something that I forgot to mention is that uh, the when we name uh, a chunk as our setup, uh, it should be, it is, let's say a unique name that we can give to, to a chunk because each time we run something in our code, it, it will be the first chunk to always run because this will ensure that uh, everything, I mean, everything else will run, will run 
if we have at first run the setup because otherwise we won't have like all the libraries that we need or like other material. So it's very useful to have it on the top of your R Markdown. And um, here, here, yes, it says that uh, parameters are available uh, within the code chunks as it is the only list named params. Uh, and then uh, here we have uh, an inline code, right? So we have R params uh, dollar sign that means it checks my class. And uh, yeah, here it plots the, the class. Write atomic vectors with the YAML header. You can also run arbitrary R express, expressions by prefacing the parameter value with um, the exclamation mark and R. And this is a good way to specify date and time parameters. So here we have uh, parameters again start uh, from the year, I don't know whatever it has here, 2018. And snapshot, again, calling um, exclamation mark R in the lead widget package. And 2015 also sets a specific hour. I don't know why you may need to do that, but yeah, whatever. Oops. Okay, uh, you can click the need with parameters option in the need drop down menu. So here we have need with parameters. And um, this way we can render and preview the report in a single user plan, let's say. Yeah. And so we can also customize the dialogue by setting other options in the header. And we can see, like, here this. Here, which we can uh, we can see more details about how to do that. And so in case uh, you want to produce again uh, parameterized reports with specific parameters taking into account, you can directly call R markdown. Um, uh, Column to two columns and uh, a render and with a list of parameters. And here we have an example. So here we take the QL uh, RMD. RMD is like the ending of the R markdown of all R markdown files. And we have, we save a list of parameters. Uh, which we set as class is uh, equals SUV. And uh, yeah, here we have again another example. Uh, okay, and this is the output. So we can also use poor RR to do a similar thing for render. And uh, apart from using the YAML, uh, uh, the, the YAML code to control like how the output will be uh, customized, you can also use it for uh, Bibliographies and citations. Again, this might be useful with the report that you want to have like a, a full uh, bibliography at the end. And uh, as it says, Pandoc, um, which is like a, say like a tool, a way to translate uh, like 
the, the language that we have, like to other uh, languages available, can automatically generate citations and a bibliography in a number of styles. And uh, for this, we, you just need to use a bib file. And uh, this is an example of the code uh, that you should have to have like a bibliography. Um, the, the best thing is that you can use like uh, many tools like BibLatex or EndNote or Medline or I guess Mendeley and stuff like that, uh, that are reference managers and um, might create uh, files that uh, are compatible with this uh, bibliography here. And you can also use the column to separate the different uh, multiple citations. For example, here you have like uh, Smith and then Doe and whatever. And you can even have like um, arbitrary comments inside square brackets, for example, C Doe here and page blah, blah. And again, this is very helpful because don't have like to, to write the, um, the citations, but you have R doing it for you. And you can add the hyphen before the citation to suppress the author's name in case you just need to have like the, um, uh, the, the, the date, for example. Uh, so when our Markdown renders the file, it will be it will build and append a bibliography to the end of the document, which will contain each of the cited references from your bibliography file, but it will not contain a section heading. So you have just to insert the heading for the bibliography section. And as it says, it's very useful to have like a references or a bibliography section in your file. And uh, the best thing even is that you can change the style of the references. So you can choose which style you want the, the reference to appear uh, using the CSL, citation style language uh, option here. Here we have APA.CSL, meaning that it will use APA to do the referencing, I guess. We will have also Chicago or whatever is used in different fields as a different citation style. And um, again, as with the bibliography field, your CSL file should contain a path to the file. Uh, here I assume that the CSL file is in the same file uh, and same directory as the RMD file. This is probably the easier way instead of having like different paths just to have a folder where it's actually your directory and have everything that the R Markdown needs in that folder. So as not to use the path all the time, but just uh, have like the name of whatever you're calling and yeah. And uh, you won't have to uh, worry too much about that. So here we have also, uh, learning more. Uh, as it says, R Markdown is relatively young and still grows rapidly. So uh, it's probably the best to try and stay on top of things by uh, checking out, for example, uh, Git and GitHub, which is great for version control. And um, there are also, as it says, many, many things that are uh, are not covered here. Uh, for example, uh, options of collaboration with our Markdown documents and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and here we have like also uh, some recommendations for uh, achieving a better writing style. Um, and here we have like the, this book uh, recommendation that the essential structure or style lessons in clarity and grace. Um, and as it says, yeah, you can have like secondhand copies or I don't know, ebooks, I guess it's also an option. 
Um, and yeah, this is the, the first part of our markdown. I see that the hour is already uh, finished. Um, so we will continue next week with the 28 and possibly with nine and yeah, I think probably one more meeting or I don't know, um, three in the worst, like today and other two, let's say maybe done. Um, okay. I mean, yep, I'm excited to actually finish. I think we have just one more part. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I think we can I can squeeze it all like in one uh, meeting like next next week because actually if you check like out here the the good graphics part is just mm -hmm. again ggplotting and how you yeah. can set different borders and stuff like that. I mean we don't need to go through every detail of that probably. Yeah. 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 Because we have uh, deal with that already. Yeah. And Perfect. yeah, workflow is super. Yeah. Good, nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very okay. much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for attending, Daniel. So okay. I'll see you next week. Yes, yes, no problems. Thank you. Bye. Great. Bye. Good night. Good night.